we just bring James to you and we just thank you for him. We thank you for the way you've touched his ministry and we just pray that you'll go on from strength to strength, showing him your way for him and the family and his church. Father, be in his mouth as he speaks to us. Bring him closer to you that we may come closer to you. Father, have your way again this morning. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's fantastic to see so many of you, friends and faces familiar, and friends and faces new as well. So thank you so much for inviting me to share God's Word with you this morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Reverend James Martin from Herschel Baptist Church, where I'm sole pastor. But in 2015, I began my ministerial training here in this church. So this is like coming home. And um, I trained at Spurgeon's College. Now, interestingly, when I was here and when I was leaving, Jane, over there, uh, Jane gave me a word and she said to me um, something along the lines of that God, um, that I was being sent elsewhere to share the love of God with others who needed to know it. And um, I've remembered that and that has been uh, important uh, to me since then. And uh, interestingly, the vision statement that we were given for Pershaw Baptist Church um, is love in action. Mm -hmm. Loving God, loving, our, sorry, loving others, and loving ourselves in the light of who Christ says we are. And hopefully in today's message, you'll get a taste of God's desire for love in all of these ways. Amen. So we're going to read a passage in just a moment um, where we're going to read of the anointing of Saul uh, by, by Samuel from 1 Samuel 10, 1 to 13. In the books on your, uh, the Bible's on your seats, it's page 279. And um, I'm going to read from the NRSV translation uh, from verses 1 to 13. Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him. He said, the Lord has anointed you ruler over his people Israel. You shall reign over the people of, your, of the Lord and you will save them from the hands of their enemies all around. Now this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you ruler over his heritage. When you depart from me today, you will meet two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzah. They will say to you, the donkeys that you went to seek are found. And now your father has stopped worrying about them and is worrying about you, saying, what shall I do about my son? Then you shall go on from there further and come to the oak of Tabor. Three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there. One carrying three kids, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. They will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall accept from them. After that, you shall come to Gibeoth Elohim, at the place where the Philistine garrison is. There, as you come to the town, you will meet a band of prophets coming down from the shrine with harp, tambourine, flute, and lyre playing in front of them. They will be in a prophetic frenzy, along with, sorry, in a prophetic frenzy. Then the Spirit of the Lord will possess you, and you will be in a prophetic frenzy along with them, and be turned into a different person. Now when these signs meet you, do whatever you see fit to do, for God is with you. And you shall go down to Gilgal ahead of me. Then I will come down to you to present burnt offerings and sacrifices of well-being. For seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. As he turned to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all these signs were fulfilled that day. 
When they were going from there to Gibeah, a band of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God possessed him, and he fell into a prophetic frenzy along with them. When all who knew him before saw how he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, What has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? A man of the place answered, And who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, is Saul also among the prophets? When his prophetic frenzy has ended, he went home. This is the word of the Lord. So the context of this passage is that Israel demanded a king from God. They want someone to to lead over them. And God has revealed to Samuel that Saul is to be their king. And what we've just read is from the anointing of Saul uh, by, by Samuel, along with the prophetic instructions and words of knowledge that Samuel was given for Saul. So this morning I want to share what I think are some important points from today's passage. The first one is this. And I think it's really in uh, in keeping with what's already been shared in the songs and in the words and in the prayers that we've had this morning. It's this. As we worship God and give him our praises, it is not God who is transformed by our worship, but it is us who are transformed in his presence. Let me say that again. As we worship God and give him our praises, it is not God who is transformed by our worship, but it is God, sorry, it is us who are transformed in his presence. Amen. But let me begin by expanding on this. Psalm 22 verse 3 is commonly translated to describe God being enthroned on the praises of his people Israel. But that same psalm has also been translated describing God as inhabiting the praises of his people. So can you imagine this, that that our praise, our worship, creates the kind of environment that God chooses to inhabit. The place where God will sit upon his throne as Lord of heaven and earth and Lord of our lives. And this illustrates to us something of the importance of praise and worship of God and how we worship in word and song and how that is fundamental in our walk with and towards God. Praise is so important. If you want to meet with God, if you want to encounter him, if you want to be immersed in his presence, then the starting place is praise and worship. And perhaps praise and worship is is more important, more significant than we perhaps give it credit for. Let me give you another example. In 2 Chronicles 20, the Israelites are aware that the other nations are rising up against them. And under normal circumstances, they would be overwhelmed by the volume and the number uh, of the opposing armies. But the Israelites, they gathered to seek God. They prayed. They declared testimony of God with them throughout their history, where God had been faithful and they waited upon him. And as they waited upon God, they received a prophetic word saying, the battle is not yours but God's. And then he carried on to say, the battle is not for you to fight, stand still. And in response to this word, Jerusalem and Israel worshipped. And the Levites, they they worshipped standing up to praise God with very loud voice. And they appointed those who would sing to the Lord and praise him to go ahead of the army. And for those of you who know your Bibles, you'll know what happened. But Israel didn't lift a finger in battle. 
But they sure lifted their voices to the Lord and they caused their adversaries to, and, and the Lord caused their adversaries to fight amongst themselves. To such an extent that all their enemies were dead and that they received an abundance of plunder. And so I hope that right now we're getting a refresher, a reminder, a new understanding of the unnegotiable necessity to give God praise and worship under all circumstances. And this is where we come back to 1 Samuel chapter 10. You see, my, my personal testimony of the times where I've been changed and transformed by God where hurts have been healed, where hard edges have been softened. This has come in the context of some praise and worship. Of giving my all in praise, of bowing down before him, of holding nothing back. Not worrying about what the others around me might think or say. <clears throat> but in absolute determination to give God thanks for who he is and what he's done in my life. And it was in these moments where I was transformed. <clears throat> Let me share one example. Um, when I was young, I was told that I was had to save a marriage and that I failed. I had the weight of failure draped across my shoulders from an early age. And that mixed with the knowledge <clears throat> that I was unwanted, unloved by someone who was supposed to love me, my biological father. And when I was perhaps 16, I was at a, a youth church. And I remember singing the words, you give and take away, you give and take away, yet my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. And it broke me. I was sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. But I was being healed in that moment. The Lord was bringing healing to me. He was whispering words of truth of how he loved me. And as I sung it and I was believing it, I was de declaring it and I was determined to, that this was how I would respond to God thereafter. And he rebuilt my identity. Today I'm at peace with myself and with the one who caused me the pain. When I was transformed, I've been made into a different person. You see, in this passage this morning, Saul meets the prophets who are being led in musical praise to God. In fact, it's described as a frenzy, isn't it? And perhaps we might describe it as unashamed and unabashed in their commitment to God, hearing his word and obeying him. And this, in this environment, an in, uh, environment that we know that God inhabits, Saul was possessed by the Holy Spirit. And perhaps of us, some of us will be uncomfortable with the term possession. So we could say that Saul was overcome, that he was infilled, he was inhabited by the Spirit of God. And the passage says that he will be turned into a different person. And such was the transformation that those who knew Saul before could see the difference. And it led them to ask the question, what has come over him? Is Saul now amongst the prophets? A friend, a similar thing happened to Jesus. When he returned to his hometown and they said, well, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this, isn't his mother's name Mary? Friends, the transformation that we may receive in Christ is enabled in our hearts positioning towards God in worship and praise. And it is fulfilled in the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. And whilst it can be surprising for some, I'll tell you something, it's blooming wonderful for us. <laughs> Amen. The second point that I want to share with you this morning is that as we walk in the plans and purposes of God, God will give us another heart. So as we walk 
in the plans and purposes of God, God will give us another heart. Another heart for the people that we are journeying with. Another heart for the people that we are called to serve. Another heart for our friends in this fellowship, our neighbours, our families. And yes, even another heart for our enemies or those that we strongly dislike. The thing is, God wants us to be like him, doesn't he? Does he? Yeah. Oh, good. Excellent. Well, God wants us to be like him. He wants us to love like he loves. He wants us to serve like Jesus served. He wants us to be people of compassion like Jesus had compassion. And this in our natural selves just isn't possible. I'm not always kind to those that I dearly love. Let alone those who annoy me or offend me or are different from me or are demanding or expecting something of me. I will get things wrong. I will make mistakes and sometimes we're tired. Sometimes we're a bit overwhelmed by what is before us. But if we're committed to God's plan and his purpose for our lives, God will give us another heart. His own heart. One which is positioned and is able to do all that he invites to do, invites us to do with him. Over the summer, Lydia and I, we, we and the boys, we spent three weeks in Scotland on the island of Isla. It's a beautiful and remote place. Uh, we spent hours and hours on beaches, on different beaches around the island. Most of them were sand beaches. Some were on the Atlantic coast, and where we were on the Atlantic coast, the sea was full of racing and rearing waves that were just rolling and diving. And it was beautiful and serene on one hand, but wild and ravenous on another. And then we'd head down another single track road with grass down the middle, because it was rarely, rarely passed by. And um, we'd arrive at a small cove. And we'd walk through fields with highland cows around us. Couldn't get a more Scottish scene unless there was purple thistles in the ground. And it was just beautiful and we'd head down to these sandy coves where it was mill pond flat and still. And perhaps we'd see a wild goat with long horns dotting across the rocks. And it was stunning and we could be on these beaches for hours and you might see one other passerby, a dog walker or something like that. On another day we visited the ancient site of Finlagan known as the Lord of the Isles. It's the place where the chiefs of ancient days would meet to gather and make decisions for the islands in the area. It's situated on a small mound of land in the middle of a loch. And this, it's in the depth of a valley surrounded by hills and trees. And one day we went on a wildlife boat, a uh, boat tour, and uh, we spotted seals and sea eagles and chuffs and jellyfish. And on another day we were out elsewhere and we saw whales and we saw dolphins and we just had an incredible time. And who knew that red deer could swim? <laughs> But they swim from the main island onto the little islands around to get to the fresh grass and the seaweeds that they like to eat and that sort of thing. And we were just stirred by the beauty and awesomeness of God's creation. And let me tell you, the temptation to give up everything and to move to a little island, I'd have moved into a mud hut if I was allowed to. So I, I return home, uh, return from this holiday, and you sort of get back into the daily pattern, and it, it can be hard to pick things back up again. And I remember reading through in my daily reading Samuel and praying that God would give me another heart. That he would give me another heart for the town and its people where he has placed me. That he would give me another heart for the people that I work with. 
for those that I serve. That he would give me another heart for my family where we are. Perhaps this morning you're sat here thinking, I could do with another heart for X, Y, or Z. <coughs> another heart and a new attitude towards something. Maybe you know that you really struggle with an individual or a family, but you don't want it to be that way. Ask God for another heart for them this morning. <coughs> that God would give you his heart for that person. Perhaps it's a situation that you're facing and you're downhearted about it or hurting or frustrated or angry. Ask God to give you another heart for that situation. And worship him. Remember what he has done in your <coughs> lives and through scripture. And ask that he would make you noticeably different in relation to that situation. But friends, importantly, and I want you to hear this, I believe that God wants us to have another heart for ourselves. That we would love ourselves in light of who Christ says we are. That we are chosen sons and daughters in Christ Jesus. That we have a hope and a future. That he will never leave us, nor forsake us, nor let us down. That you were wonderfully and fearfully made. That as was said earlier on, he saw us and he saw that we were very good. Many of us deep down aren't satisfied with who we are. Too fat. Too old, too tall, too short, too unwell, too shy, too miserable, too emotional, too depressed, not clever enough, not as able. And if that's you, then ask God for another heart for yourself this morning. His heart for you, that you would love yourself as he loves you, unconditionally. Because we are commanded to love God, to love one another. But that command concludes with, as we love ourselves. This isn't vain or arrogant self-love, but it's to see ourselves as God sees us. As those beloved children. That you would know that God loves you so much that he would rather die than live without you. To know that you are God's very good idea. The thing is, folks, we're in a world where, where it's fallen, where it's broken, where our understanding has been trained, our eyes and our thoughts have been trained and directed to think differently and away from God's thoughts. You see, I cannot count the number of times when I've heard people say to me, I'm not good enough so I can't. I hear people in churches tell me how sinful they are or how they have been in the past and they believe that somehow that makes them unsuitable and unfit for service to God. But let me remind you that there is a powerful and common biblical theme that God chooses to use people who when measured by our standards appear unsuitable. They appear as unlikely agents of God's Purposes. Jacob was a liar, a runner, a cheater, and a pretender. Moses was an orphan who had a speech impediment and was a murderer. Gideon was fearful, had little backbone, and had no self-confidence. He hid away to do his work. Ruth was a Moabite widow. David had an affair with another man's wife and tried to cover up what happened by sending him off to be killed. And what about that little-known peasant woman 
from Nazareth could matter. And that's the, 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 the disciples, aren't they? And then Paul, a.k.a. Saul. All these flawed people with faults and failings, some hugely significant and some even in today's liberal world would be considered unacceptable or at the very least poor form. <clears throat> so this morning and in the weeks and days ahead, be kind to yourselves. Ask God to give you another heart and offer yourselves as willing and available to the Lord. And he will choose the when and the how he shall use you. And finally, friends, I know and understand that some of you may be thinking, well, hang on, James, this passage was about a specific time and a specific event for one individual at a certain time, a certain situation. So why should we say this can apply to our own lives? How can this be applicable to us? And I'd say this, because in this passage we see a principle or characteristic of God. God is in the business of transforming lives. God is in the business of enabling those who others says are not able. Amen. And as many of you will know, I, I have a little history in this church. And I would say that this message is a message for you as individuals, but also as a church. And I say this because... The environment of worship where Saul was transformed was an environment of corporate worship, worshipping with others, a gathering of few or many for the purpose of praising and uplifting God's name. Isn't that what church is? It's not the building, is it? And the spirit was with the prophets who were in the prophetic frenzy, the church. And the spirit filled soul, the individual responding to God's word in worship. So as a church, commit yourself to worship and praise of God, despite the challenges that you face. Remember that the battle is not yours, but is God's. Give him praise and worship and watch him transform the situation before your eyes. Praise the Lord. Worship him. And exalt him unceasingly in the days ahead. And as individuals press into the Lord in worship. Be transformed in his presence and by his spirit. Receive another heart today. For God created us to worship him. It's within that environment of worship where God can bring transformation in our lives. That we may serve him and lead others into a relationship with him, that they too would receive another heart. Amen. Amen. Let's just pause for a moment and reflect. Jesus, your goodness knows no bounds. We delight in you and your word. How you speak to us, how you challenge us. Give us new hearts this morning, Lord. May we be transformed by you. Have your way in this place your way in our lives. Be glorified, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.